Good to see everybody here today um, for our last retreat seminar of the year. So thank you all so much for joining us this year and we'll start out again in October um, for our monthly, almost monthly series. Now, before I turn it over to Gary Segura, Professor of Political Science and Director of INSPIRES, or the Institute on the Politics of Inequality, Race, and Ethnicity at Stanford, who's going to introduce our speaker today, I'd just like to thank our co-sponsors for today's event. Uh, so first, of course, I must thank INSPIRES, since this is part of our year-long seminar series spotlight on race and politics, so we featured one speaker each quarter, and Professor Masuoko will be our last speaker of the year. Um, and I'd also like to thank the American Politics Workshop, who's been our partner throughout the year, coming to attend our events. So thanks so much for joining us, and we hope uh, you continue to in the future, especially for these timely topics right now around race and politics. And I'd also like to thank the program in Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, as well as the Clayman Institute for Gender Research for their co-sponsorship of today's event and for helping us spread the word. So now let me turn it over to Gary, who will introduce our speaker. Great. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, our guest today, Natalie Masuoka, is an Associate Professor of Political Science at Tufts University. Um, in the Metropolitan Boston area. Um, and I've known, I, I say this with some trepidation, but I've known Natalie since she was a beginning graduate student at UC Irvine, uh, and now she has tenure, so that says an awful lot. Um, but um, Natalie uh, studied at the University of California, Irvine, um, with a large group of uh, race and, and behavior scholars there. Her first book, entitled The Politics of Belonging, Race, Public Opinion, and Immigration. She co-authored uh, with Jane Jun, uh, a friend who's spoken here in the past. Um, in Natalie's work, she repeatedly looks at uh, not just a, a single group, which some of us in race politics tend to, tend to do a lot, but her work is truly reflective of the comparative nature, both of uh, CCSRE's mission um, and of the world where um, we live in an increasingly multiracial um, era in American politics. Um, so Natalie's work has moved from uh, being initially comparative uh, simply about race and political attitudes to starting to think more broadly about the entire question of identity, including immigration and immigration status, uh, gender and gender identity, uh, sexuality, and of course race, ethnicity, and now uh, mixed race identity. Um, so she definitely proceeds from the spirit of having a broad uh, analytical framework and, um, and asking important questions. Her new book is entitled um, Multiracial Identification and the Racial Politics of the United States, and it's forthcoming, I believe, at Cambridge University Press. Uh, Oxford. Oxford University Press, sorry. Uh, the other press. Um, and, uh, and I think the, that she'll have some comments to say that will be reflected of some of the things represented in that book today as well. Um, Natalie is a special scholar and a friend. I appreciate her willingness to come out here um, and, and share with us her work. And thanks again to the American Politics Workshop uh, for integrating her efforts with ours. So please join me in welcoming my friend, Natalie Nesla. talk to you uh, about race, um, particularly uh, what I want to do is uh, use the opportunity to think about how race is changing uh, for us in the 21st century, um, building from uh, my work on mixed race identities, how it broadens to think about gender, uh, possibly sexuality, um, and uh, a little bit of uh, aiming a state for us since we are running right into an election. Uh, so I can't do political science, uh, science without coming up and talking to you a little bit about what's been going on in the election. So um, what uh, I wanted to talk about today, I actually changed the title of my talk a little bit um, primarily because uh, what I want to do is make a general conceptual claim. Uh, it's a claim uh, that is aimed at social scientists, but I think uh, more broadly than social science, I think that this would be helpful for us thinking about race and how race is changing, uh, even for those of us that don't necessarily uh, study quantitative behavioral data like I do. Um, so this idea of 
identity versus classification, or what I would call uh, more specifically a sign classification, uh, has built from the group that I've been thinking about for a very long time. Um, this is a newspaper series in the New York Times that was running a few years back on mixed race Americans. Um, and what I wanted to do here is I'm presenting this image mainly because it is depicting what I argue is commonly what we how we present mixed race Americans today, which is really this new demographic group, right? So we've got, you know, kind of this, you know, now that we um, are documenting uh, two or more races, right, now we can have all of these various different studies thinking about this new population. Are they different? What are they doing? What are they doing in their in, in, in school, right, um, all the various different interesting social science questions. One of the things here, however, that I've really found problematic about the ways in which we present mixed race Americans today is it's in many ways very ahistorical, right, and this is of course a wonderful audience here to have this conversation, um, and you know, I think there, in fact, in this country, there are new populations, primarily one being immigrants. They, in fact, do arrive to this country. They are brand new. We can then document them and their demographics and various different, different social attitudes. Um, however, for mixed race Americans, my argument today here is that uh, they are not necessarily new to this country. Uh, we can document them, and for that reason, that is why identity versus classification matters, or has come up as a conceptual idea. Um, but, you know, historically, uh, we uh, have been very aware of mixed race in the United States, uh, really since uh, the colonial era. Um, uh, just as a piece of evidence here, this is an old 1904 Census Bureau report talking about the percent mulatto, uh, so basically the mixed, black, uh, mixed race black population within the, quote, Negro population um, in the post-civil rights er era. So we can see here, right, that many ways we have thought about mixed race, we've been documenting uh, their existence. Um, and so uh, here, um, what I wanna do is really present uh, one of the ma main conceptual arguments that I made in my book, which is that rather than think about mixed race today as a demographic group and our new demographic group that we can study, um, rather what I wanna think about uh, multiracialism in the United States really is, as an identity uh, group. Um, and the reason why we can now document and we can see multiracial happen today is primarily the way that we uh, collect data on race today, which is really through this process of self-identification. Um, and so we can see a multiracial uh, population because people can self-identify as such. Uh, it, is, it is an opportunity provided by uh, various different federal, state, and even um, uh, uh, you know, kind of mainstream business, um, for-profit types of institutes uh, that allow today Americans to say that they are two or more races, right? Um, so we can see today uh, what's happening is that it's attributed to the ability to self-identify as mixed race. We have, you know, various different terms that come up, they call themselves mixed, biracial, there was a group that they call themselves swirlies. Um, and as a result of really thinking about multiracial as self-identification, really this helped me generate um, a historical narrative about thinking then, why is it uh, that we are in a moment where we can see Americans self-identifying as mixed race, right? So kind of how is this, how did we get here? Um, and what does this say about racial formation in the United States today? And so the argument that I wanna make today here is that in our era today, we're really thinking about race uh, really as a sense of personal identity. So kind of self-expression, um, a sense of self, um, and it's one that individuals are allowed to express uh, to various different entities and the various different entities in which we collect data on race. Um, one of the attributes here is that identity then um, implies that there is a lot of personal agency in the power you have to, to declare a race, right? So it's uh, giving a lot of sense in us as individuals that we can determine how others see us, how others see our race, right? And we can express this as a, as a, as a form of identity. Um, from a historical perspective, however, what I think is really important to press uh, and, and, and emphasize here is that this is really a contrast to historical formations of race, which I will call 
uh, really practicing race as assignment. Um, and so I um, came across this really cool poster um, from the Harvard Half Asian People's Association, which is on my right-hand side, which I think was really just, if it could be anything more perfect about the uh, conceptual uh, framework that I'm trying to promote here, is this poster, um, which is this poster with various different mixed race people in the back, or, or you know, the, the various different students that are part of the group. Uh, they say, I am, right, and they are what I'm gonna call established or classic, racial and ethnic categories here, black, Chinese, white, et cetera, and they're struck through, right? So kind of figuratively here how these historic categories don't necessarily make as much of a difference, right? And instead, there is this I am in bold here with a figurative fill in your own blank, right? So um, this perfect for me uh, depiction of self-identification as it's related to race, right? So this I can choose who I am, I have the ability to fill in the blank however I want to, okay? Now what I wanted to do here is then contrast this image that I saw a few years back with the historic image that we tend to see, that we've seen historically associated with racial classification, which is that historically, you were classified as white, uh, or effectively non-white, uh, black, uh, i.e. Negro, Asian, Mexican, etc. cetera, uh, not necessarily because this is something that you conceived of yourself, right? But, but these are categories that were imposed or assigned on you. Uh, they were not necessarily part of a, 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 a process of personal choice. Um, and that there were consequences for that classification, right? And so that's why I wanted to put this uh, picture on the Southern segregationist picture up here on the right, uh, on the left hand side, to really depict, you know, really how we experienced race you know, pri prior to the area, the era of identity that I'm arguing we're living in today. And the consequences here, uh, when you were assigned, what that meant for your life chances, right? What that meant for your rights and citizenship level, uh, and, and the, the um, various different types of practices that you were able to engage in uh, because of the type of categorical assignment that you were given. Okay. So here, um, what I want to what I want to do here is talk about uh, the fact that we switched from this idea of thinking about race primarily as a process of assigned classification to this idea of personal identity. Okay, now, I realized doing this talk uh, in front of a lot of uh, interdisciplinary groups, I realized what you know, makes me distinctive here as a political scientist is the emphasis that I, as a political scientist, are gonna put on various different types of governing institutions and the role in which governing institutions play and in ways in which we think about our culture, our society, and what I'm gonna argue today, the ways in which we think about racial formation. Uh, and the meanings assigned to different types of racial categories. So today as a political scientist, and I don't necessarily want to, uh, to downplay that there are other processes that are going on, uh, but I want to uh, use what we term as uh, a historical institutional approach and think about the role of the U.S. Census and how that has explained our transition from thinking about race as primarily assignment uh, to one that now incorporates this idea of, of personal identification. Um, and in this way, uh, the census for me is a story not just about uh, what the census is doing in terms of the types of racial categories that they offer uh, for, for, for us to, to document racial populations, but also really as a social scientist, how we collect that data. And that data collection for us uh, also, I'm going to argue today, really does um, imply specific ideas about how race functions. Right, and uh, impacts really our knowledge about race. Uh, and so the shifting here of how we collect data, I'm going to argue today, likely will have uh, very consequential uh, and possibly serious and statistically significant effects here on the ways in which we understand race to be linked with other types of social behavior. Um, so to kind of start here, um, I have, uh, this is a picture of the 19, um, I believe this is 1950, the 1950 census, or 19, possibly 1940, um, census, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't have the, I don't have that um, date here on my slide. Um, but from the uh, first census through 1950, um, the way that race was collected was uh, that it was documented by the enumerator. 
right? So uh, the census, when we go around collecting um, the population data every 10 years, um, for the first, uh, first you know, the majority of the data collection, an enumerator went to your home or went to a, a dwelling uh, and then documented who was in that dwelling. And as an example of how race's assignment was practiced, right, I have here the instructions to enumerators. So you can see here that this is the, effect, effectively the code book or the descriptions of what the enumerator, when they got to the home, needed to, to mark for the uh, race or color of the respondent. And we can see here that this is a case where the government was defining how they determined uh, who was classified in each racial category, right? And had very explicit directions on what you can do. Um, and I know this is a little bit small for those of us in that. So for example, here we have uh, item 151 for quote Negroes. A person of mixed white or Negro blood should be returned as a Negro, no matter how small the percentage of Negro blood. Both black and mulatto persons are to be returned as Negroes without distinction. Right, my other one here, uh, my favorite one here is about Mexicans. Practically all Mexican laborers are of mixed race, race, racial mixture that's difficult to classify, although usually well recognized in the localities in which they are found. Uh, in order to obtain separate figures for this racial group, it has been decided that all persons born in Mexico or having parents born in Mexico uh, who are not definitely white, Negro, Indian, Chinese, or Japanese should be turned as Mexican. Uh, actually, this is, uh, since I have this from that's the 1930 census, right? So, you know, kind of this idea that, of course, you know, you would see it if you knew it, uh, and the localities would know, right, and they would actually be able to give you some marker of what makes you Mexican. Um, the, other, the other one here, right, for, for blacks, uh, the reclassification that even though you might recognize they're a mixed race, right, there was really no mixed race category here in 1930, uh, and so they will return, not as soon as a, as a, as a self-identified or identified mixed race person, but in fact, uh, we're singularly black, right, as a consistent uh, with our historic role um, uh, of high points, often termed high points percentage, just like the one drop, globally referred to, right, as a one drop rule, uh, established plus the purpose, right, this idea that if one kind of partial African blood, quote unquote, right, you would be identified as singularly black. Right, so the idea of the ways in which we have conceptualized racial categories, uh, mixed race has been assigned to non-white categories, right, where whiteness has been assigned really as kind of racially pure, kind of a, you know, group that uh, doesn't necessarily have any kind of ancestral overlap uh, with anything uh, outside uh, particular European uh, ethnicities. All right, so. Um, what's interesting here is over the 20th century that we, we do have a switch in how we collect data. So for the majority of the time, right, we've got the enumerator coming at home, the government is telling you what these races are, you then follow directions, you check the box, right, or you, or you fill in the form. Starting in 1960, um, really this, is, this, was, this was really attributed to the fact that the population was getting way too large for the enumerators to come directly to every single, right, we're in the modern era, every single dwelling. Uh, and so the census decided um, more for practical reasons, right, to use a form, a mail-in form that they sent to all, each household, and asked each household to fill out their form. Right, now what I'm gonna argue here is this is the real kind of starting point here of how we're collecting modern data which is that we're asking Americans to self-report who they think they are. Right now, and relatively gone now, while there are some directions still about what race is, uh, we are allowed now to interpret race as we think it is. Right, so now you have a census, you look at these categories, uh, it's, it's not as the federal government telling you, right, what you should be returned as, uh, on the census, but rather you know, what you think those categories mean and to what extent you think you belong in that category and how you are going to report that. And so starting here in the 60s, uh, we start having uh, our first wave of self-reported data. So I'm going to argue here that this shifts, right? So now we have data that was pre previously assigned. Now we have data that's now identification. We then get into what, you know, what we could call hyper-identification when we get to the 2000 census. Uh, where a group of activists uh, of interracial couples 
uh, lobbied uh, the OMB to change the race question. Now, not only do you, can, do you still self-identify, but now you should be able to mark any box. Have any number of boxes apply to you. Uh, you should be, they are, you should be constrained to one box, right? Because that's, that is inaccurate, and it doesn't reflect different types of family histories and family backgrounds. Uh, and so as a response, uh, the OMB decided to add the words, mark one or more, on the 2000 census, so now we can have hyper choice here, an identity choice. And so now we can express our identities in even kind of, uh, more flexible ways than just filling out the form and requirement to submit one, only one category. Right now we can submit uh, as many as we uh, think are, are, are applied. Um, so here we can see historically um, how just in terms of thinking about one institution, how the ways in which we think about race conceptually as assigned to identity have changed, but also right how we're collecting this data and then as a result, what I want to argue today is we, we should be, um, as scholars, then more conceptually precise about what the data we're using now is really reflecting about our world. Okay? Um, and since I do a lot of um, data uh, with uh, survey research, uh, various different levels of individual reports, uh, what I did want to take a moment today uh, is talk about then you know, kind of the consequences um, not being as precise or, or as um, nuanced here about, uh, about how we're collecting the data, how we're conceptualizing the data, and how we then theorize about what the data uh, really is reflecting about our social world. Um, each method that we use, I'm not necessarily going to stand up here and say, you have to use this one. Okay, so that, that, that is uh, what I often get misinterpreted as kind of coming up here and saying is that there's one that's better than the other. Uh, there's not necessarily one that's better than the other. What I actually want to say is that there's actually no one objective way for us to measure race. Um, what I'm actually just arguing is a more nuanced point, which is that different types of methods in which we collect race are going to report different types of phenomenon in which we, we experience race. Okay, so um, what I want to do here then is think about how we collect data like in the census or through survey research or any kind of other individual level report research that's trying to report facts about our country, right, um, and think about uh, the different methods in which they are uh, being collected um, and classifying them here into different categories of assigned classification versus identification. Um, historically, I'm going to argue, the way that we've collected individual level data has really has been an assignment, assigned classification. Uh, that's primarily because, you know, due to um, you know, kind of less advanced technologies that we have today, right, there, um, our data w has really been collected as a face-to-face -face phenomenon. So we go up to someone, we interview them, um, and for a large uh, part of uh, our history, um, in terms of data collection, the interviewer has assigned the person their race. Um, we still have that today in various different forms. Uh, today, face-to-face, -face, of course, is extremely expensive uh, because it's very extremely expensive, right, to go and contact a nice randomly distributed uh, s a sample of thousands of people, right, and have someone go door-to-door -to -door and ask them various different questions. Uh, so that has kind of fallen out of favor more out of practical reasons than anything. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we don't necessarily have assignment in the ways in which we collect race. Um, today, actually, the census, I'm going to argue today, in many ways, is race by assignment. Mainly because the way that we collect the census data is it's a household report, right? So unlike a telephone survey where they call you and they ask you, you to tell, tell us about yourself, the household survey is given to one person, ideally the head of the household, right? And that person that, for those of us that have filled out the survey, we ideally know this, um, we fill it out for everyone else in the house. Right, so um, the head of the household then, while they're self-reporting themselves, they, for, for everyone else in their house, they are assigning race to everyone else in the house, okay? Um, when we think about what the census is documenting in, in terms of the two or more racist population, uh, the average age of the two or more racist population in 2010 was 19.9 years, or median age. Um, sorry, that's, that, that's imprecise there. The median age was 19.9. It was uh, 22.7 20 in 2000 when we first allowed respondents or Americans to check two or more races, okay? What does that mean here? 
That means, right, that for a good amount of the people who are being captured as a two or more racist population, likely their parents uh, or uh, whoever is responsible for them in the house are assigning that two or more races to them. So one, uh, what I'll say today is that this kind of idea of the census documenting something uh, is likely going to change, particularly as this generation that is a child or, or a dependent that's being assigned to them by their parents be grows older, right? And then they are then filling out the form on their own and they might actually think about themselves as something different than what their parents thought of, right? Uh, there's a really uh, great study actually by uh, my now provost, uh, David Harris, uh, and his, co his colleague um, uh, Sims, uh, who studied the, uh, some of the data from the um, adolescent, um, the study on, a longitudinal study on adolescent health and adult health, at health study. Uh, and they found that um, comparing the way that parents, they looked at the household, right, and they, they interviewed the parents, they interviewed the children, and they interviewed teachers. And they found out, right, that they asked uh, parents, the children themselves, and the teachers to assign the race of the child. And they found, right, that the parents oftentimes assigned a race that's different than the child actually, in fact, self-identifies, right? So we already have evidence here that once we move into this idea of self-identification, uh, or, or um, uh, aging of these two or more racist populations, this demographic is going to change, right? So one, the size is going to shift, right? And it's likely going to be very fluid. Uh, the size of this population is going to be very fluid every single time we take that enumeration, right? Because you're going to have some people that are self-identification, and you're going to have other people here that are assigned, right? And then, but these populations are not consistent uh, over time. Um, in contrast, today, um, most of the data we have, uh, I argue particularly when we study public opinion data, um, is a measure of self-report. Uh, this is the case where you are being called on the telephone or you're taking an internet-based survey and you are responding to the scholars or the researchers about yourself, right? And so therefore, this is a measure of how you self-identify so what I wanted to argue today for my survey researchers in the room um, is that while we tend to think about measures of identity as kind of more explicit or direct questions about how you think you are. So uh, historically, social scientists have talked about uh, measures of identity, racial identity as uh, a question such as the racial group I belong to is an important reflection of who I am, right? Or how close do you feel to another group, right? So these are questions that we typically think of as an identification question. What I want to argue today is that just by asking the, demo, the, demo, the demographic question, what is your race, is in many ways today a self-identification question, right? Because you are self-reporting yourself, um, and uh, this is a report of who you think you are. We should therefore not necessarily be surprised that when we see effects of group-based identities off a group that's sorted by the race question, that we're going to see an identity effect, right? Because you basically have self-selected people of a specific identity who've said that they are a race, right? And then you show uh, that that identity does in fact matter in many ways, right? That that is uh, in some ways an endogenous uh, type of measure. Now today, uh, what I wanted to do is not necessarily talk about uh, mixed race people themselves, but it's also very difficult for me after thinking about this group for very long to do a presentation without actually kind of talking about some of the more nuanced points uh, that I would like to make um, about what this means about our knowledge about society, particularly since we're using this race data to create, quote, facts about our world, right? The census talks about, you know, kind of what, what is the snapshot of our country um, without really questioning kind of these different methods in which you collect them. There was an old uh, study after the 2000 census uh, was implemented that marked one or more races uh, by the General Social Survey. Um, they wanted to determine effectively what I'm arguing, right, which is that is there a difference when the interviewer assigns your race versus when you self-report your race, okay? So basically what they did is they took the same uh, 14, uh, for about 1,400 respondents. Um, first, the interviewer classified them. Uh, it was a face-to-face -face interview. They classified them. Um, unfortunately, the GSS doesn't give us a lot of detail, but it was white, black, and other race. 
So you can see here my first column from the left hand working towards the right is what the interviewer reported the racial breakdown. This is, these are not unweighted. So this is effectively just what we found in the survey. Um, what the interviewer saw of the race of the respondent. We can see here that the majority uh, here is white um, and a 5% of the sample was other race. Uh, then later in the survey, the interviewer then asked, well, how do you self-identify, right, to see exactly how self-identification differs. And what's really important here, right, is um, one, uh, it's not the same number. Um, and uh, we do see movement, particularly, uh, right, uh, less so with those people who are classified as white uh, or black, but really with this other race category, right? So this kind of flexibility here, other race here really in this case were Latinos. Uh, and so we can see here, right, that this uh, assignment versus self-identification, while maybe more precise when we were thinking about homogenous, uh, classically kind of, you know, European white populations, right, that there's still variants here, right, but, you know, generally less concern. Uh, but as our population is getting more diverse, particularly, right, when we're seeing uh, various different groups like Asian Americans and Latinos, uh, enter the population, we see more, more of a problematic situation where the race of the interviewer, right, doesn't necessarily uh, match. Um, the race that the interviewer assigned is different from the self-identification. And here, really, what I'm trying to see, show here at the bottom is that the mismatch between self-identification and observation, uh, right, is the, the kind of most prevalent here, um, more prevalent for minority populations and the most prevalent here for um, other non-black uh, minority groups. The other thing that I did want to say really quickly too, which I think is an important point, is uh, kind of who is it that is um, personally self-identifying as mixed race? So what has happened now that we're allowing individuals to self-identify as mixed race? How is this changing now from, in, um, from 1990 through, or basically before 2000, right, the 1990 census and prior, when you're only allowed to mark one box, but now you're allowed to mark multiple, right? How has this shifted or changed the size or our knowledge about what these populations are? What I wanted to do here again is this is data right after the change of the 2000 census, so it could this uh, like possibly has changed, but I would argue probably uh, not as much so. Uh, but this survey here asked first, uh, the first question respondents were asked, um, what is your race? And you can only choose one. So they forced a one-box uh, solution. They did, uh, they did offer Latino as a, as a specific racial category. So you can see here uh, what the distribution of the respondents were if they were only going to self-select one race. Then later in the survey, they were then asked, uh, do you consider yourself to be mixed race, right? And then we can see here um, how the size of the different racial populations uh, does vary. Um, primarily here we see non-white populations more likely to say yes to that question, right, than white populations, right? So kind of where is this two or more racist population really giving us a lot more fluidity and change and shift and changing? It's really about how we're thinking about various different non-white categories, right, and non-white groups. Uh, this is really largely uh, where our movement is. So these are kind of, uh, you know, two important points here as we're kind of thinking about mixed race. Um, the, um, the idea here that I do want to say is that this is not necessarily just about multiracialism, right? Self-identification has broader effects uh, on a, at a race level. Um, one here, the, more, the kind of you know, tongue-in-cheek here example is the kind of exponential increase in the American Indian population uh, since the 1960s, right? So ever since we've been able to allow self-report uh, of your race since the 1960s, right? We've seen this really exponential um, inc uh, um, increase in the number of Americans that self-identify as American Indian, or at minimum, uh, at least American Indian as one of their races, right? So this population, I think, grew 110%, right, between 1990 and 2000, whereas the white population grew by 8%, right? So if we're kind of thinking about this, just even just as birth rates, this is not necessarily possible. So when we think about self-identification mattering, right, again, this is not just about multiracial, multiracial identified people self -ident where self-identification matters, but it's really all of these various different groups. Um, I had originally in my title uh, put transgender uh, in my title, mainly because for me, 
the correspondence with gender and race today, thinking about this in terms of identity, uh, for me is uh, really very much aligning. Um, I've gotten some kick, uh, kind of, you know, kind of flack here for trying to correlate race and gender together. Um, so you'll kind of bear with me here and, and uh, just go with this argument. But um, I'm going to argue today that um, in general, what we have really thought of as objective or immutable or inherent characteristics like race and today like gender, where we think, right, there's just kind of this objective answer to who you are. This shift in this self-identification culture is not just applying to race. And I argue really it also applies to all, a lot of other categories that we think about as being these kind of objective, immutable, uh, inherent characteristics, one of which being gender. Um, and what's really interesting is really how we're now thinking differently about how we capture gender uh, for individuals and the increased use of identity-based questions, right, when we think about documenting gender. Um, and of course, I was, uh, you know, really quite excited to see uh, when the University of California system, really in, in this state, right, decided to add a question, I think there's still a sex question or a biological sex question, but they've also added a question for gender, self-identified gender, and are allowing you to talk about your identity. And just like race, we are now allowing multiple categories, right? So this kind of, you know, fruiting or flowering of different identity choices for me um, is an important correspondence for us to think about how this, this culture of self-identification is really starting to uh, bleed in, right, to many different types of categories uh, out there. Um, I didn't actually necessarily have time to collect data. That was actually going to be my goal here for Stanford uh, for this presentation. So unfortunately, we don't get to talk too much about uh, transgender identities. Um, this is kind of where I wanted to go originally, uh, but uh, got a little bit distracted from some of the politics data with uh, everything going on um, related to the election. Um, so um, I'm going to shift a little bit. It's still in the same spirit of thinking about assignment and identity. Um, a lot of my research really has been thinking about identification, right? And I think about the, those people and how they self-identify. Um, but what a lot of um, reviewers, a lot of every time I come out and give a talk, uh, folks always say, you know, you tend to really emphasize this idea of identity, but really your story is also about assignment. And it's about really, uh, you know, kind of what can we make of the fact that race in many ways still has a non kind of self-identification dimension to it, right? Like you can self-identify however you want to, but people are going to look at you and they're still going to see something and your interactions with those individuals are going to then impact, right, be impacted by the way that they see you. And so I've really made a shift a little bit over the last uh, few years then thinking about assignment, right, and then thinking about really does this identity matter? How much are people really paying attention to what's when someone says, I'm biracial, right? So like the, the kind of liberal academic in me and says, well, of course people are going to pay attention to that, right? Like, you know, how many times have we been with a student and they say, I'm this, and you're like, okay, you know, like I'm going to work with you, this is what you self-identify with, and I'm going to treat you as such, right? You, I self-identify as gender, as transgender, you self-identify as biracial, and I will go along uh, with that self-identification. Um, but um, I think um, the case here that I want to talk about today uh, really does uh, reflect how this identity might not have as many much consequences, at least in this moment, as those who self-identify with um, these non-established or non-traditional categories might believe. Um, since I'm a political scientist here, um, I do want to focus on, uh, you know, the number one case here uh, in my life uh, uh, after he was elected, uh, and I've been talking about identification, uh, which is Barack Obama, um, and how um, this idea of assignment versus identity uh, plays uh, the role in how we think about Barack Obama and to what extent uh, this impacted our vote choice about him and the racialization um, of the 2008 uh, election and then, of course, 2012. Um, so I want to start here by showing the pictures that we all saw in 2008. So here's his 
multiracial, biracial, or mixed race family. Uh, a lot of these pictures were promoted to the public. Uh, his white mother, his white grandparents, uh, his stepfather right, was Indonesian. He spent a lot of time in Asia. Uh, his sister is, is white, and, uh, ident or they identify as white and Asian, right? So we were given this message of mixed raceness uh, as to the public, biracial. Um, however, uh, while that was a story, um, what I'd like to really emphasize here is that Obama himself self-identified as black. Uh, so um, here's a little story here from the 2010 census. He checked only black as a self-identification. Uh, he was pretty public on his self-identification as black uh, throughout the 2008 election as only black. Um, and so we are in this context here where uh, voters are given this idea that he's mixed race, right? But then at the same time, he self-identifies as black. Um, uh, you know, we believe that his treatment as black made a difference. Uh, one of the things here that uh, the ANES directors, one of them sitting here right in front of me, were kind enough to put on this question on the 2010 to 2012 uh, American National Elections um, pilot study. This was in 2012. Uh, respondents were asked, how would you describe uh, Barack Obama's race? So basically what we wanted to, what I wanted to capture is um, what were they seeing, right? Uh, we gave them the census choice of marking all the apply. Uh, they were randomly given uh, an order. So this, this is the order I'm presenting to you, but they, it was it was randomized depending on um, when you were given that survey. So you were given white, black, Hispanic, mixed race, Asian, or other race. Um, and what's really amazing here is the amount, one, the amount of variation that we have in what people check as Barack Obama's race. Um, and two, the relatively small share of Americans who said he was only black. Um, so one, um, you could see here at the top, these are the people, the first four are the people that said only one race, uh, and that was the race, right? And then I've got the two races, check two races, and then check multiple races. Um, I put the full sample together on the, so the, all respondents, uh, but because over time I've realized that there was a big difference depending on if the respondent was white, black, or Latino, um, I have disaggregated that for you. And so what you can see here is that for whites, uh, the overwhelming majority here said Barack Obama was mixed race, singular mixed race. And then if you count all these other people that said multiple other different things, um, uh, that, num that share of people who said he was mixed race grows even bigger, right? So basically less than a quarter, slightly less than a quarter said uh, um, black. Of course, uh, almost no one said white. One person, that was a self-identified Democrat, by the way, so that was interesting. Uh, so one person said white, so no one said white, but they did say mixed race. Um, split here for blacks, um, slightly more uh, mixed, said that more mixed race if we count kind of everything, but blacks were more likely to say that Barack Obama was black, uh, and Latinos actually, interestingly, were more likely to say that um, Barack Obama was mixed race. Of course, then the question is like, who are these people who are saying that he's mixed race versus black? Is this this a, a, a racialization, right? So who's more likely to think of him as this racialized black person versus this kind of other mixed race person. I thought at first, which is what, how I know that this is, um, a, that one person was a Democrat, I thought at first that this would be a partisan divide, right? That, you know, because we think about this as an increasingly racialized society, right, where um, for Republicans, kind of anti-black sentiment was really explaining uh, a lot, what we know is it was explaining a lot of why you wouldn't vote for Barack Obama, right? So those are effectively our Republicans. Um, but if you look first at white respondents, there is actually isn't a, a gigantic difference in the makeup of Democrats, independents, and Republicans that say uh, Obama is mixed race versus black, right? So independents are slightly less likely to say he was, uh, slightly smaller proportion to say that he was black. But in general, uh, not a big difference. Um, just for kind of interesting uh, sake here, I'm going to do Latinos and blacks. Um, there were like five respondents here in Republicans, but uh, all five of them said that Barack Obama was black. Um, and uh, we do see a, um, actually even controlling for some things, for blacks, there is actually a statistically significant difference there on the difference on party. Um, and then for Latinos, uh, we see uh, very similar to, in some ways, very similar to 
um, whites uh, where there's not as much of a party differential. Uh, but we do see here what Latino Republicans um, are more likely, or you know, kind of the, they have a smaller share here um, that are saying just singular mixed race. But if you kind of put them all together, it's effectively the same. Okay, so one, I really just kind of wanted to test like, is there kind of some baseline uh, kind of party effect? Mainly because um, what I found here is that, well, maybe that's actually kind of explaining uh, some of what's going on. Now, there's not necessarily a difference in if you are a Democrat or Republican or, or you know, kind of white Democrat versus white Republican. That's not necessarily explaining why you see Barack Obama as white or black. However, the evaluative effect of seeing Barack Obama as one or the other actually was a pretty robust finding, even when controlling for things like age and income and et cetera. Um, however, the effect is different if you're a white Democrat versus if you're a white Republican. So interestingly here, um, so what I have here, the two blue bars are white Democrats. So here's the um, mean uh, feeling thermometer. So this is the general question, you know, how, how warm do you think about Barack Obama? So effectively kind of like how positively disposed you are. And that's on a, a scale of zero to 100. So 100 are the people that are feeling very warm, right? So the higher the bars, the more warmer you feel towards Barack Obama. And we can see here, uh, what I just divided this in is just these are the mean uh, thermometer ratings. Uh, the blue here are white Democrats. Um, the kind of white and black uh, mixed bars are white independents. And then the red bars are white uh, Republicans. So in general, right, consistent with party identification, Republicans are less likely to feel warm about uh, Barack Obama compared to Democrats. However, there's actually no difference in whether or not Republicans who saw Obama, Barack Obama's black versus mixed race um, in the way that they, that's not, there's, even though that kind of, the, those numbers are, the raw numbers are different, but that's actually really not statistically significant. The real finding here is that um, for Democrats, if they saw Barack Obama as a mixed race person, they were actually more likely to be positively disposed. They had warmer feelings. Uh, no effect here for, there's no difference here for independents. Again, in a different way of measuring your attitudes towards Obama, right, this is, um, do you approve of his job? Again, we have, I found there was no effect for independent, white independents uh, and white Democrats, however, for white, uh, or white Republicans, I'm sorry, white Democrats, however, if you saw Barack Obama's mixed race, you then had a higher job performance. On the opposite end, when we talked about, uh, when the, people were asked about various different other kind of more, um, you know, kind of, racialized or kind of, you know, incorrect or um, negative, what they identified as kind of negative traits about Obama, we then saw the effect not for Democrat, white Democrats or white independents, but actually for white uh, Republicans. So here, there was a racializing effect here for white Republicans that if they saw him as black, right, they were more likely to then also report that he was Muslim versus people that mixed race, right? And then uh, this is less of an effect, but still statistically significant. Uh, if you thought that Barack Obama paid too much attention to race and gender in his official appointments, no effect for Democrats, no effect for Republicans, or for independents, I'm, right? But for Republicans, if they saw him as black, they were more uh, likely to think there was too much attention, right, to race and gender. Um, so this idea here, right, this is my, my last, I'll do this as my last slide since I was running out of time. The idea here, right, is um, this, this idea of assignment right, um, generates uh, a whole other rich area of research. Um, while it's difficult to talk about and explain, I haven't quite figured this out yet, why people see race in different ways, there is an important effect in how you assign race, right? And even for something like this, um, uh, just for Barack Obama, right, these, these, these results were very robust, right, uh, even with this kind of minimal um, questioning here about what you think his race is. And I will stop there and we'll take some questions. <laughs>